Uh, My friends, we're in Luke chapter 6. We're going to read our text in a moment. The portion that we're going to look at has three sections, and it's all about Jesus and those who follow him. These followers are called by the name of disciples. What is a disciple? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Now think a moment before answering the question. Are you a disciple of Jesus? I think most people here would answer yes. Some might sincerely be unsure, but what is a disciple? Well, let me just propose a a simple definition for us to begin with. Disciples of Jesus Christ are those who have chosen to follow him. They made a decision to follow him. So disciples are faithful followers of Jesus. Notice the adjective there is faithful, not perfect, because that would exclude then all of us, but faithful followers of Jesus. Now, last week... Kevin preached from the previous passage here, and he made the statement at the beginning, and he went back to it again. He said, Jesus is the one who sets the terms for what it means to follow him, because in and of ourselves, we can have all kinds of ideas about Jesus, the way we would like to think of him, and uh, they may be, to various degrees, accurate or inaccurate, but it's when we actually read the Bible and try to see what Does Jesus say about himself? What do the gospel writers say about him? What did he really do? What did he really say? It's only when we do that that we come into a clearer picture of of who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. So remember that statement from last week. Jesus is the one who sets the terms for discipleship. Disciples or people have chosen to follow him, to accept those terms and to be led by him. Disciples have made a decision to follow Jesus, but that's not the whole story. Uh, We're going to read in a moment about some special disciples. They did choose to follow Jesus, but what we're going to read is that Jesus chose them. They were special ones. Jesus chose them by name, and he called them apostles. So reading from Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, in these days, he, that is Jesus, went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God, and when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So, Jesus spent a night in prayer, and when daylight came, he called his disciples, and there were a lot of them. There were a great crowd of disciples, as a matter of fact. There were many who were already following Jesus, but out of that group, he chose 12, and those 12 he named apostles. Now, that's a special word, it has a special meaning here in the New Testament. The Greek verb apostello means to be sent. And the noun that's related to it, apostle or apostolos, is one who is sent. It means one who's sent, presumably on a mission. The term could be applied to an ambassador, a representative, someone sent to represent a king in a foreign land. It could refer to an envoy, uh, somebody who represents another. 
And in this case, the apostle is one sent by Jesus on a mission with a commission because Jesus is now beginning to organize his movement. He's beginning to lay the foundations for the church that he will build. And it's significant that in doing this, he starts by naming these 12, which shows continuity with Israel, God's chosen people. See, there were 12 tribes of Israel. Now there are 12 apostles. That's not a mistake. It's not by chance. They're going to form the basis of a new people, but who are still connected, spiritually connected to Israel. Because Jesus is a reformer. He's not a revolutionary. Uh, change is coming, but Jesus is not overthrowing everything. The nation of Israel has leaders, and those leaders are rejecting Jesus. They're in the process of opposing him. We've already seen some of that in the earlier chapters of Luke here. The opposition has begun, and it's only going to increase in the verse just before what we read. The scribes and the Pharisees are filled with fury at Jesus because he's challenging some of their misconceptions about the law, about the Sabbath. That was the topic last week. And their fury and their opposition is just going to get worse. So these 12 men will form the basis of a growing movement, the kingdom of God, and though it starts small like a grain of mustard seed, it's going to grow into something very great. Christ's kingdom is going to grow. These 12 that Jesus chose were the first leaders of his church and so they have a special role. Uh, these men are eyewitnesses to the reality of Jesus. They are eyewitnesses. They're going to bear witness to the life, the ministry, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. They're going to be official, designated eyewitnesses of the reality of Jesus Christ. Jesus told them in Acts chapter 1, you will be my witnesses. Interestingly, the Greek word for witness is martyr. Transliterate the words, we get our English word martyr. These men are going to testify to what they saw and heard and they will maintain that testimony even when threatened with death. And as far as we know, all of them did die for their testimony. The only one who perhaps didn't was John who was exiled on an island for the testimony of God's word. In other words, these guys would literally become martyrs, witnesses in the literal sense. They will die for the truth that they saw and heard. And some of them, before they died, would commit their eyewitness recollections to writing. And the writing that they did, you have sitting in your lap right now, it's your New Testament. Well, what about these actual 12 men? We have their names here. Some of them became well-known like Peter. Others of them remain shrouded in mystery, and we know very little about them except perhaps their names, maybe a little bit about what they did as recorded in Scripture, and then the tradition of the early church gives us a little more information. For instance, there's a pretty good tradition that the Apostle Thomas traveled to India and carried the gospel there, and there are other such traditional stories, but there's not a lot we know. Uh, there, there are, however, certain things that we do know, uh, one thing, these men were ordinary men. Uh, they had ordinary lives, ordinary occupations. Some of them were fishermen. One of them was a tax collector. They had, before coming into this position, no great accomplishments that we're aware of that commended them to Jesus. Oh, I've got to pick this guy. He's really accomplished. No, they, they had a basic education, but they were not learned men. So they were ordinary. Also, they were 
different from one another. They were not all alike. They had different personalities. They had different political views. Matthew was an employee of the Romans. He collected taxes for them. Matthew worked for the Romans. Another, Simon the Zealot, wanted to overthrow the Romans. So they were ordinary, they were not alike, uh, but they were handpicked by Jesus. They were special disciples and specifically named apostles. So they're in a special, separate category. There are no others like these guys except Paul, who also was specifically called and commissioned by Jesus. So if you ask me, are there apostles like this today? The answer is no, there are not. Uh, however, there are people who do believe that there are still apostles. They have to qualify that a good deal when they say that. Um, but in this sense, no, there, there's, there's nobody like these guys. Uh, by the way, if you would like to talk about that or anything else further, please, your pastors here are here for you to talk about these things. We love to talk about the Bible and theology and how we're living our lives. We are approachable. Uh, I, I, we're nice guys. You can always talk to us. I have an email address. I'll talk on the phone. I'll meet you in person. This is why we exist, okay? So don't ever hesitate. Don't be out there saying, eh, I'm not so sure about that or I don't agree with this or what did he mean when he sent that? First pray, but then if the Lord directs you, come and have a conversation. I'd love to do that. Anyway, okay, back to the sermon. Uh, these guys were his choice. He picked them. They were ordinary. They were not alike. They were hand-picked. That leads to some perhaps puzzling questions because here's another fact. These men were not only ordinary and dissimilar. These men were men. Not one of the 12 was a woman. Did you catch that? And without reading too much into this fact, couldn't Jesus have at least chosen one woman out of 12 if he wanted to make a point? But he didn't. You say, well, that was because of the tradition, that was because of the custom. You saying Jesus was afraid to break with custom or tradition? That's all he's been doing in the gospel, and he's going to continue to do that until they kill him for it. So, without reading too much into it, in the New Testament, leadership is male and plural. And of course, that's a big issue for some people today, just something for you to chew on. I mean, the Apostle Paul is considered by some to be a chauvinist, right? He wasn't. But nobody considers Jesus to be a chauvinist. Yet not one of the 12 chosen was a female. Also very puzzling, of these 12, Jesus chose one who would betray him. Judas Iscariot, in other words, was not an accident. Oh, Jesus, maybe if you spent just a little more time in prayer that night, you could have avoided this mistake. But it wasn't a mistake. Jesus knew from the beginning who it was who would betray him. Have I not chosen you 12, and yet not, is not one of you a devil? No, I mean, this is, this is puzzling. But you see, Jesus does not avoid evil. He actually confronts it directly and eventually Jesus will turn evil on its head, it's instructive for us to realize that evil in all its forms is unable to overturn the will of God. It was by the hands of wicked men that Jesus was crucified and killed, and yet Acts 2.23 says that even this was according to the predetermined counsel and foreknowledge of God. Go figure. Now, Jesus uses evil, and God uses evil for his own purposes. This is a very deep and a troubling mystery, and we can only stomach it if we have faith. But God is greater than evil, and he has everything under control, even when it doesn't seem like it. Remember that. 
God has everything under control, my friends, even when it doesn't seem like it. Jesus chose Judas. And one of the things that tells us is that Jesus not only knew what it meant to be rejected, he also knew what it meant to be betrayed. Have you been rejected? Well, so has Jesus, and far more than you or me. Have you ever been betrayed? Well, so has Jesus, far more than you or I. Because of that, He's a sympathetic high priest whom we can approach when we've been betrayed or rejected. He knows what it means and he can have compassion on those that are hurting. He's able to comfort you and me because he's experienced the worst the world can offer. So, these are special disciples who are called apostles. I said when we began that disciples are those who have decided to follow Jesus. They've chosen him. But notice that in this case, at least, it's true to say that disciples or apostles in this case, some of these disciples have been chosen by Jesus. And as a matter of fact, everyone who is a disciple, everyone who is a Christian has been chosen by God Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that from the foundation of the world, God chose us in love in order that we might be holy before him. And Jesus did say to his disciples at one point, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Now, they did choose him. But the mystery is Jesus' choice of them and of all his disciples is a prior reality. All right, let's move on to the next section, which tells us about two different groups of people, a great crowd of disciples and a great multitude of people. Verses 17 through 19, and he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. Do you see how they're distinguished? These people came to hear him and to be healed, to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Now, bypassing for a moment the great crowd of disciples, let's consider the great multitude of people. Why did they come from all over? Because they came from all over. Tyre and Sidon are far in the north, and all Jerusalem and Judea were further south. So this is a big geographic area, and all these people are coming. It's a great multitude. Why did they come? Well, they came to hear him, and to be healed. So these people obviously believed in Jesus in some sense, that he was worth listening to. So they came to hear him. Now, most of those of you that are here today would consider yourself to be disciples, but perhaps there's some that are here because they're checking it out, maybe like these people. Uh, they came to hear, they were attracted, they heard about Jesus, and in some way, shape, or form, they had some belief in him. And so they came to hear him. They thought he had some answers. They also, though, came to be healed. So they believed that he had some powers. They thought he had some answers. They thought he had some powers, some abilities. He could heal disease. He could cure those troubled by unclean spirits. And verse 19 says this, it says, the crowd sought to touch him. They believed that just touching him would bring healing. Notice, they weren't afraid of him. They wanted to touch him. They wanted to be near him. They were drawn to him. He was approachable. He wasn't scary. He was kind. They wanted to be near him. They wanted to hear his teaching. They wanted to touch him so they could be healthy. They believed he could help him 
help them in, in their distress because they had troubles, like everybody's got troubles. The world is a difficult place. They had troubles, and they thought Jesus could help. You know, maybe that's you. You've heard of him. Maybe you've read the Bible. Maybe you've heard stories from the Bible. We all have troubles. Jesus is someone that you're drawn to. He can help. He can comfort. Maybe your parents or your grandparents have told you about him. I'm thinking of the young people that are here today, children and teenagers. You know, when I ask that question, are you a disciple, you may be scratching your head saying, I, I don't know, I think so. What, what does it mean? I mean, this is all I've ever known. I grew up in a home where they believed in God. And, and yet I'm saying that a disciple is someone who chooses to follow Jesus. And you may be thinking, um, yeah, I want to choose him, but what does that mean? You're, you're learning, and, and it's really important. It's great you're here. I'm so glad there are, are children in our midst that are listening. God knows you. God loves you. God's looking for you. He wants you to choose Jesus. Because when your parents or your grandparents or friends tell you about him, they're doing a good thing. You trust them and they want to be helpful to you. Maybe you have a friend that's talked to you about Jesus like he's real, even though you've never seen him. Because for all of us here, I mean, don't you think that there is more to reality than what we can just touch or smell or see or hear more than we can encounter with our senses. On Friday, we were burying in a cemetery a dear sister, Vernetta Wallace, died, and we had a funeral for her on Friday, and then we went to a cemetery and we buried her. And as I was talking to the family that were there and talking about, we will see her again, she will rise from the dead. I was talking about spiritual realities that are at work, uh, this thing called the resurrection of the dead. Uh, and I said to the folks, don't you think that there's more to reality than what we can just see, feel, taste, touch? And that they nodded their heads because they had faith. Faith that Vernetta would rise from the dead at the general resurrection when Jesus returns. Faith that this life is not all there is. Faith that there is a reality that we can't see, spiritual realities. There are actually spiritual beings. There are angels and, and demons even. Don't want to frighten you. Don't worry. God is in control of all things. But spiritual beings that are around us that we can't perceive. And that there are realities like the kingdom of God that you can't see it but you believe it? Yeah, there are these realities. And folks, this is one of the only places you're going to hear about it where it doesn't get weird because we're sticking to Scripture. Yeah, there's more to reality. Jesus is real. Though you can't see him, he's real. He's alive. He's good. He's kind. He's approachable. He's loving. He's caring. But that's not all there is to Jesus. And we're studying this gospel so we can learn more about him, learn more detail about just who Jesus is, learn what it means to believe in Jesus and to follow him. Because the great multitude came from all around, and they believed in him in some sense. But Jesus wants them to be disciples. He wants us to be disciples. He wants people to believe in him, not just so they can hear cool teaching and get healed from diseases, but he wants people to believe in him so that they will follow him and carry on his life and message to glorify God. It will certainly benefit them, but it will carry on to benefit others. Disciples are those who follow him. If we do follow him, it's going to affect the way we think and the way we live because Jesus wants disciples. Do you want to be a disciple? I hope everyone here wants to be a disciple, and as soon as you hear a little bit more about maybe what it involves, you will be a disciple, believing that he lived, he died, he rose again, and that if we call on his name, we will be saved. And then, just as he commissioned the original apostles to go into all the world to make disciples, 
They did that. And disciples then made other disciples down through the ages and around the world so that you and I, if we are disciples, are sitting here as disciples today because they obeyed what Jesus said. Jesus wants us to be faithful followers. So in the final section of our text, Jesus begins to teach about what it means to follow him. Jesus is about to begin now his most famous sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's the most famous sermon ever given. It's an amazing sermon. It's so amazing that no one has been able to fully grasp the depth of the wisdom that it contains. It it almost defies analysis. Depending on who you read that's commenting about the Sermon on the Mount, you'll get different takes on how it should be understood, how it should be analyzed, and that's because it's so, so very deep. Jesus was the greatest teacher who ever lived, and this represents the greatest of his teachings, the greatest of his sermons. We're going to look just at the beginning lines of the sermon, and he said these words in Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 26. This is the final section today. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples, notice, and said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. In verse 17, it says, Jesus came down to a level place to teach. I thought this was a Sermon on the Mount. Well, that's how it's referred to in Matthew's gospel, the parallel account in Matthew. But this is Luke's version, and it's a bit different from Matthew. Same sermon. Sometimes it's referred to as the Sermon on the Plain because he came down to a level place. Well, isn't that a contradiction? No, no. Jesus was on a mountain, and he came down perhaps a certain distance on a mountain to a plateau, but it's still a mountain, and it'd go down further. It's just a question of semantics, perhaps. But Luke's version is more suited to Luke's purposes, and it begins with a section of blessings and woes. In Matthew's account, you just have blessings, the Beatitudes. In Luke's, you have blessings and woes. And here's a clue. Blessings are good, woes are bad. Okay, there's a clue for you. It's an important clue. This is a prophetic introduction to the sermon. Because Jesus, as I said, is about to give a major teaching. This is what it means to be disciples. I'm talking to my disciples right now, it says. However, there are a lot of people within earshot, and they are very welcome to listen in because this is a teaching about what it means to be a disciple. Anyone can listen, but it's especially intended for disciples. He lifted up his eyes on his disciples. Now, it's a prophetic pronouncement of what it means to be a disciple. To be a disciple is to be filled with blessing. And blessing means to be envied. Blessing means joy and long-lasting happiness. For me, it's like Christmas morning and the last day of school all wrapped into one that goes on forever and ever and ever. Amen. To be a disciple is to be filled with blessing. But the way Jesus explains it here is not what we might expect. 
Now, after this introduction, Jesus is going to get into what we call ethical teaching, what we ought to do, how we ought to live, how we ought to think, what we ought to avoid. But right now, he's giving an intro into it. And remember, last week, Kevin said, Jesus sets the terms for how disciples should live. Next week, we're going to get into the details, but this is just an intro. It's prophetic in the sense that it declares what is and what is to be. And basically, Jesus is saying, if you line up with this, you're lining up with me. And you'll not only be lining up with me, but you'll be lining up with the true prophets who went before me. And what is true for them and me will also be true for you. Does that sound good? Yes. All right. Now, this is what it'll be like. You'll be blessed. You'll be blessed when you're poor, hungry, crying, hated, rejected, reviled, and cast out. Does that still sound good? Now, wait a minute. What about the abundant life? I thought you'd come to Jesus and live happily ever after, right? Yeah, well, on the face of this, this doesn't look like blessing at all. Because we don't usually associate blessing with hunger and poverty and crying and being objects of hatred and scorn. Now, that sounds more like curse than blessing. But you see, that's what it was like for the prophets. And this is what it's like for Jesus. Now, I just gave you a quick overview and I left some things out on purpose. That was clever of me. Okay. But what I said was true. It's just not the whole story. Let's look at it a little more closely. Uh, but before we do, I want to cite a Bible commentator by the name of Daryl Bock, B-O-C-K. He's from Dallas Theological Seminary. And he has some very helpful things to say about this kind of in the overview of it, some points that make this a little more understandable. And this is my paraphrase of, of what he says. Uh, it's important for us to understand as we read these that number one, there are blessings they have to do with the kingdom of God. Blessings have to do with the kingdom of God. That's the first point. We'll unpack these in a moment uh, and, and we'll talk about what the kingdom of God is. Okay, blessings are associated with the kingdom of God. Number two, there are these things called reversals. Reversals. Anybody that, that loves drama knows what I mean when I say reversals. Something looks like it's going one way and all of a sudden, boom, it's going the other way. And it, it builds tension. It's dramatic. And there's lots of drama in the life of a disciple because there are these reversals. And third, persecution. Persecution is assumed throughout. So there are blessings that have to do with the kingdom of God. There are these reversals. What's true now is not what's going to be true later. And throughout, persecution is assumed. All right, so first of all, Jesus says, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Verse 20, kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. You are blessed, you poor, because you have something called the kingdom of God. Now, in the kingdom of God, Jesus is truly king, but it's a spiritual kingdom. Paul described the kingdom of God as not being a matter of eating and drinking, material things, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So when we come to believe in Jesus and follow him as king and confess him as Lord, we enter into his kingdom and we experience righteousness, peace, and joy. We have peace with God. We receive a robe of righteousness, and we have joy. We have peace because in peace with God, our sins are forgiven. We have righteousness because he justifies us through Christ, through our faith in Christ. And all that leads us to having joy. The kingdom of God is a real kingdom. It has arrived with the arrival of Jesus, but it has not manifested in its fullness it's already here, but it's not here in its fullness. That's why it's referred to as being already, but not yet. The kingdom has come with Jesus, but it won't be until he returns in glory 
that the kingdom will appear in its fullness. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come. It's come, but it hasn't come in its fullness. So Jesus can say, blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Not will be, but is. I have peace with God now. I have the gift of righteousness now. And I have joy in the Holy Spirit now. You see, ultimately, my biggest problem has been solved. I'm an old man, and soon I will die. But it's going to be fine because I will enter into the presence of the Lord. Now, if you say to me, well, show me your salvation, I say, I can't take it out of my pocket and show it to you. Because right now, the form it's in is in my heart, it's internal, and it's spiritual but it's real and it does manifest itself in various ways because that's why I have peace and joy and righteousness but it's not a matter of material goods and so Jesus is speaking to the poor and he says yours is the kingdom of God now one thing about the poor is that they're hungry and Jesus said blessed are you who are hungry now for you shall be satisfied yes it's very possible to be hungry right now as a disciple, but you shall be satisfied. So you have the present and you have the future. Similarly, he says to those who weep now, you shall laugh. What he means is what is currently true will not always be true. There, in other words, is a future orientation that a true disciple has. He knows that this world is not all there is. He's future-oriented. He knows, yeah, there is a here, and it might be rough, but there's also a hereafter, and there's going to be fullness there. Now, all of this requires faith, and that's characteristic of the disciple. Jesus says this is the case. Jesus says this is a spiritual reality. And we, disciples, with the eyes of our faith, look at it and say, yes, it is so. Disciples, in other words, believe what Jesus says. That's what we do if we're disciples. There are reversals. What is now is not what will be. Thirdly, persecution is assumed. It says, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. So persecution is assumed because you are lining up with Jesus, the Son of Man. And then he gives a little command here. He says, rejoice in that day. Not in the future day, but rejoice in that day when you're hated and excluded and reviled. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. Jesus says to rejoice and then he explains, this is how the prophets were treated. He's saying, line up with me, line up with the prophets. You're persecuted, you're in good company. But the key to it all is why. Why the persecution? Why the poverty? Why the hunger? Why the weeping? Why the rejection? It's on account of the Son of Man. Well, what does that mean? And who is this Son of Man? Well, Jesus uses the phrase son of man to refer to himself. And right now, at this point in the Gospel of Luke, it's a rather ambiguous term. He used it a little bit earlier when he said, the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sin. And they were outraged by that, but he was referring to himself. Eventually, we're going to see that this phrase son of man is a phrase that Jesus uses to refer to himself in connection with an eschatological, that's an end times figure who has great power and authority that's mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. Because when he is put on trial and he's accused by the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief rulers and elders, he says, you will see the Son of Man coming in power with the clouds of heaven and they knew what that meant that figure is the one who's going to usher in the final time that figure is the 
final judge of all things. The Son of Man will sit on his throne and will judge and separate between the sheep and the goats. This is a powerful figure. When we line up with the Son of Man, when we're persecuted or hungry or because or an account of the Son of Man, we're lining up with Jesus and the prophets and we're saying that, yeah, yeah, things may look bad right now, but there's going to be a final accounting of all things on the day of the Lord and that we believe in that and we're lining up with him because we're going to follow him. We want to line up with Jesus. That's the main thing. Because you see, the other side may look good right now, but there's coming a great reversal. Verses 24 through 26. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you. For so their fathers did to the false prophets. Now these pronouncements, prophetic pronouncements, are warnings. And it's the disciples who are listening to it. So it's important for us, self-proclaimed disciples, to hear these warnings also. They're meant to keep us online. Jesus is speaking to disciples and anyone else with an earshot. And this is different from Matthew's gospel where he just has the blessings, the beatitudes. Luke has woes. They would find these words, the disciples, surprising and even shocking because generally in the culture and in the world and even today, we associate being rich and full and laughing and well-liked as blessings from God. And they could be, but not necessarily. As a matter of fact, there's great danger in them. For Luke and his gospel, the categories of rich and poor are very, very important categories. Um, they do have socioeconomic value. In other words, rich materially and poor materially socioeconomic categories like that are important to Luke, but that's only part of the story. That They also have a spiritual dimension, and both the material and the spiritual are important. So this is not just a matter of who are the haves and who are the have-nots, because the poor in Luke are the godly poor. The poverty that they have, the hunger that they have, the weeping that they have, is as a result of lining up with Jesus and following God. They're not poor, in other words, because they're lazy or because they refuse to work. It's not because they're unwilling to work. See, it's possible to be poor as the result of foolish and sinful choices, and we see that all around us in our world today. But what Luke has in mind is the godly poor who are poor because they choose to line up with God. There is such a thing as ungodly, indolent poor, but that's not what Luke has in view. And it's the same thing with the rich. The rich upon whom Jesus pronounces these woes are the ungodly rich who are rich because they grind the faces of the poor. Their wealth is their God and their belly is their God. And Luke gives us the story of the rich man and the beggar a few chapters later. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man fared sumptuously all day. There was a beggar who would have been happy to eat the crumbs that fell from his table, but the rich man had no care or concern for him. And Jesus tells this story. He says when that rich man dies, he ends up tormented in Hades. But Lazarus, the poor beggar, is carried by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. And I know that doesn't sound like a blessing. I hope Abraham has his shirt on. But Lazarus is lying in the bosom of Abraham and that is the place of blessing and comfort. 
Now the rich man speaks to Abraham from a distance and he calls out and he says, oh, would you please help me? But Abraham answers him rather matter-of-factly and he says, remember, son, that you in your lifetime received good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted and you are in anguish. Pretty stark. I guess it's always bad to be rich. No, not necessarily, because Luke also tells the story of Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus? He was a wee little man. A wee little man was he, okay? Zacchaeus was a very rich tax collector, and he got a lot of his money by unscrupulous means. But the difference between the rich man in the story of Lazarus and Zacchaeus is that Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. And because of Jesus, Zacchaeus repented and gave generously to the poor, and Jesus made the statement, salvation has come to this house. So, there are such a thing as the godly rich, but more often the case, there are ungodly rich because wealth presents particular challenges. The wealthy are easily tempted to trust in their wealth instead of in God. Those who are full, those who are stuffed, those who have power and wealth are usually corrupt. Those who indulge in derisive, mocking laughter of others will also experience reversal. And the man-pleasing that's inherent in this, it's not necessarily wrong to be well-liked. I mean, who wants to be hated? But these are well-liked because they will trade the truth for popularity. These are those who game the system for their own personal prosperity. These woes describe the cost of going the way of the world. Now, it is dangerous to be wealthy, and we would have to consider all of us here uh, we live in the richest part of the richest nation in the history of the human race. So I think these words apply to us. Beware, be very, very aware of the danger of riches. It was said by the Puritans, poverty hath slain her thousands and prosperity her tens of thousands. And Paul gives instruction to the rich who are rich in this world that they should be generous. We should be generous. We should give. We should give to the poor. We should have concern for others. So these are warnings for us, my friends. But the point in this prophetic pronouncement, this introduction, these woes and blessings, is that at all costs, we should line up with Jesus, with the prophets. We should avoid lining up with the false prophets. This is very heart searching. This is something that is challenging and I think should make us all squirm a little bit. What is it that motivates you? You need to ask yourself that question when you ask yourself, am I a disciple of Jesus Christ? Do I just brush this off as, oh, that doesn't apply to me? Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus is speaking these words to his disciples and their words of warning, but when we heed the warning, we avoid the danger. It's a reality check. Who will I line up with? Next week, we're going to begin to look at some of the ethics of the kingdom of God. Again, it's going to be very searching because basically Jesus' ethic is an ethic of love. It's an ethic that will put self-sacrifice ahead of self-benefit. It's an ethic that will disadvantage the disciple for the advantage of the other. Uh, when we come to understand that this is what Jesus himself did and we want to follow him, then some of the same things that motivated him will motivate us and we'll come more and more in line with what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But for us here, today, right now, I just want to leave you with that question. 
am I a disciple? Do I want to be a disciple? With whom will I line up? What does it mean to follow Jesus? One last thought, my friends. It's all by his grace. God told us to consider ourselves, even if we are servants, as unprofitable servants. But as I was reading in my daily Bible reading this morning in Matthew's Gospel, when we do our best to be faithful with what he's given us, first by grace, then the Master will be able to say to us at the end of our days, well done, good and faithful servant. Do you want to hear those words? I do too. If we hear them, it will all be by his grace, but I will cooperate with that grace. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for these words from the Gospel of Luke. Perhaps they're not what we wanted to hear today, but they're what we need to hear because we want to follow you. I trust that's true of everyone within earshot of my voice. Grant us grace, Lord, to trust in you and to walk with you, to hope in you and to believe in you, that we might follow you in Jesus' name. Amen.